When you think of impressive game companies, you might think of Konami, who was constantly pushing the hardware limits of the NES. But there is a lesser known company doing the exact same thing, Sunsoft. They made some impressive games and utilized enhancement chips just like Konami did. But how did this all go down with Nintendo's policies in the US, and how were the games as a whole? Let's take a look. What's going on? It's Poger, coming at you with another video. Alright, so if you've seen a couple of my videos and you like what I do, hit that subscribe button right there. By hitting it, you'll be notified whenever I make a new video and I do make weekly content. I haven't plugged this in a while, but I do have a store. Just go to shop.poger.net. We got t-shirts, coffee mugs, and more. All right, let's talk about Sunsoft. In 1971, the company Sun Corporation was formed. At the time, the company handled the manufacturing of electronics. The video game world was very new back then. So, six years into their operation, they decided to enter the arcade video game market, which would last until the mid-80s. Some of their most well-known arcade titles were Kangaroo, Icky, and Arabian. Their arcade games were popular enough to be ported over to home consoles. Kangaroo, for example, received a port on the 2600 and other consoles. Speaking of home consoles, Sun Corporation noticed the popularity of them, so they started developing games for the Famicom. It was around this time when Sun Corporation started going by the name Sunsoft. As expected, they did bring over some of their own titles to the console. In Super Arabian, you play as a prince who must collect all the pots that were marked with a letter. It's a single-screen game, which is well in line with earlier arcade titles like Donkey Kong. Route 16 Turbo is another arcade title that was brought over to the Famicom. Here, you must navigate through multiple tracks to obtain all the flags. Like with Pac-Man, you move automatically, but you have a speed-up button, and when you hit a wall, your car automatically turns. Both of these titles are well-done arcade ports and a very strong start on the Famicom. Not only did Sunsoft port over their own games, but they secured agreements with other companies to port over their games too. They brought over Fantasy Zone to the Famicom. It's a defender type game where you must destroy all the big enemies and then fight a boss. You can buy items in the store that help you out along the way. Surprisingly, all the bosses would remain intact and were not changed, which is something that not even the Master System version could do. Later on, Tengen would publish their own version of Fantasy Zone, but despite the three-year head start, Sunsoft's version was much better. Unfortunately, every Famicom game I've talked about so far was never released in the US, although sometimes you see Super Arabian and Route 16 Turbo on some pirate multi-carts. Sunsoft would finally make their US debut with arcade ports of Sky Kid and Spy Hunter, the latter of which they developed. It's a vertically scrolling racing game where you can shoot enemy vehicles and you must score as many points as possible. There's a timer at the beginning that protects you from death. When it runs out though, you immediately lose if you crash, unless you have a free life. Not much to say about this version, but it's a well done adaptation of the arcade game. Sunsoft would really prove that they knew what they were doing when it came to making excellent arcade ports. I imagine the companies that allowed Sunsoft to port over their games were happy about how the console versions came out. In 1988, we would get Sunsoft's first real standout title, Blaster Master. You play as Jason, who has a pet frog that runs away. The plot is that you have to find him. It's a platformer where you play as Jason inside of an armored tank. You have a cannon that you can shoot enemies with, as well as weapon upgrades. There's narrow passageways you can access by leaving your armored tank, which lead to a top-down stage. These stages will always contain a boss you have to fight. It's not a linear game at all, and you commonly have to backtrack in order to make it farther in the game. This is one of the first NES games I'm aware of that scrolls in multiple directions at the same time. The stages are massive for NES standards. This title would showcase something that Sunsoft would become known for in their games, excellent music. This is a fantastic game, and commonly regarded as one of the best games on the NES. In 1989, Sunsoft would begin securing licenses to movies. 
Movie producers most likely did their research and saw how well Sunsoft's arcade ports were and thought they would make excellent video game adaptations of their movies. Generally, movie-based games have a reputation of being bad, but how would Sunsoft handle them? Their first movie-based game would be Batman. It's a platformer where you must make it to the end of the stage without losing. Your main attack is punching, but you can obtain weapon upgrades and you have a life bar that lets you take a certain amount of hits. You have a wall jump that you must master in order to maneuver to higher platforms. The graphics are dark, which matches the movie atmosphere very well. Because the NES can only display a certain amount of colors at a time, I imagine using a dark color scheme allows the developers to include more details in the graphics since they only need to use darker shades. Like with Blaster Master, the music is excellent in this game. Batman on NES would prove that movie licensed games are not always bad. In fact, even if they replaced Batman with a completely unmemorable character, this still would be a great game. Speaking of which, here's one licensing agreement that did not work out. You play as Jay, who must avenge his father's death in this running gun game. You start off with a weaker gun that has unlimited ammo, but you can obtain better weapons that are temporary. Jay's physics are somewhat realistic, where you can't control your direction mid-air, so it's an extra obstacle that you have to work with. This was originally going to be a Terminator game, but the license was lost during development, so rather than scrapping it, Sunsoft would rename it to Journey of Celius. One licensing agreement that did work out, however, was The Gremlins. Not the first movie, but the lesser-known sequel. You play as Gizmo, who roams around in a top-down perspective. You have a projectile that you can throw at enemies, and you can obtain currency that allows you to purchase items. Surprisingly, you can jump, and there's a lot of platforming, which is very ambitious for an NES game. A lot of other NES games in this perspective are usually much clunkier, and you usually can't jump. But here, it controls very smoothly. It almost feels like an actual 3D game. Sunsoft did a really good job capturing the atmosphere of the movie, with the graphic style and the excellent music. I didn't even know the NES could produce music that sounds like this. The cutscenes are also very well done, almost like what you would see in a Ninja Gaiden game. So it seems like no matter what the obstacle is, Sunsoft has always managed to pull it off. They've made excellent arcade ports of their own games, ports of other companies' games, and movie-based games. And some of their later games were very impressive. The only real hurdle keeping them from pushing the hardware limits even further was Nintendo themselves. In Japan, video game companies were putting enhancement chips in their cartridges to boost the hardware capabilities beyond what the console could normally achieve. Sunsoft was one of the companies following this practice. After all, they did manufacture electronics in their early years. But in the US, Nintendo didn't allow third-party enhancement chips. Instead, there was a list of approved chips that companies were allowed to pick from. Because of this, many Japanese games that were brought over to the US had to be downgraded. For example, the US version of Contra is missing background animations that were in the Japanese version. However, Sunsoft would get a big break with their next game. Here's Batman Return of the Joker. It's creative that Sunsoft used the Batman movie license to make a second game, as there was no Batman Return of the Joker movie. The sequel to the first movie would be Batman Returns, which Sunsoft did not obtain the license to. It's a very linear platformer where you're equipped with a gun, and you walk to the right to beat the stage. You collect numerous upgrades, and you can charge your gun to unleash a powerful attack. The game is much different than Sunsoft's previous Batman game. You can no longer wall jump, and the levels are much smaller. Batman is more well detailed, and the graphics are overall much better. There's a lot of moving background layers on numerous stages, and it looks amazing. It seems like Sunsoft was going for a more realistic control scheme because you cannot jump very high, and you can't change your direction in the air very effectively. The game is extremely difficult. You take knockback when you're hit, which can result in death. The stiffer controls also don't help with platforming. Despite the much different approach they went with this sequel, this is a fantastic game and extremely underrated. In Flyers, this game was often compared to 16-bit ones and for a very good reason. 
Sunsoft put in their own enhancement chip called the FME7 that increased the amount of memory by using bank switching and allowed for easier split-screen scrolling. Fortunately for Sunsoft, Nintendo relaxed their policies on third-party chips at this point, so Sunsoft was allowed to use the FME7 chip in the US versions of Batman Return of the Joker. Because of this, we were able to get an unchanged version of this game. Another game that used this mapper was Heapyreek, also known as Euphoria. It's a platformer where you must save your friends. You can jump on enemies as well as pick up and throw items at them. Along the way, you unlock characters that have special abilities and you can also unlock special moves. The game is very non-linear, so you do have to explore and it's possible to get lost. It's fun to use characters that you recently unlocked to access places that were previously never thought possible. For example, the main character cannot swim, but the first character you unlock is able to. The music is fantastic, some of the best I've heard by Sunsoft. This is a fantastic game, but unfortunately it was only released in Japan and Europe. There was a plan for it to receive a US release, but that never happened until 2010 when it was released on Virtual Console. The characters from Hibiurik would be seen in future Sunsoft games, but unfortunately these games were not platformers. Instead, they were puzzle games, racing games, and fighting games. Come on, we don't want these, we want a platformer like the original. Thankfully, a little over a week ago, we would receive an official sequel more than 30 years later on Nintendo Switch, Steam, and PS5. One of Sunsoft's most ambitious projects was Mr. Gimmick, also known as Just Gimmick. They really went all out on this game because they used an enhancement chip that boosted the NES in ways that were never thought possible. The plot is that a young girl gets a toy for her birthday and then at night, the other toys come alive and capture her. Now, as a new toy, you must save her. It's a very linear platformer where you must reach the end of the stage and fight a boss. You have the ability to summon stars, which can destroy enemies, but you can also platform on them to reach higher areas. It's a very difficult mechanic to get used to, and often you'll be mindlessly throwing stars until you get it right. There's secret items in each level that you can obtain. They're not required, but you can unlock an extra stage and get the good ending if you retrieve all of them. The controls are very well done. When going downhill, you gain momentum and are able to move much faster, almost like a Sonic game. The graphics are extremely well done, with lots of detail in the graphics and many colors on screen. The characters are all well animated, almost as if they're actually moving rather than just playing a few frames of animation. The music is some of the best I've ever heard on the NES. This would be no coincidence. The chip that they used is similar to the FME7, but with added sound capabilities. This makes the game sound like nothing we've ever heard on the NES. Unfortunately, only the Famicom was capable of sound expansion, so when Mr. Gimmick was released in Scandinavian territories, the sound expansion had to be removed. The game would sadly not be released in the US at all, not even a virtual console release this time. The game is also very expensive, so outside of paying exorbitantly high prices or finding a ROM, there's not many ways to play Mr. Gimmick today. The reason this game and Euphoria didn't receive a US release was because the characters were so oddball, they did not think it would appeal to a US audience. Sunsoft would get their foot in the door by releasing some excellent arcade ports of both their own games and titles from other companies. Not only that, but they proved it was possible to make movie-based games that were actually good. They would take things one step further by using enhancement chips to boost their games even more. Sunsoft proved that they were one of the heavy hitters on the NES. Hey, I just wanted to thank you so much for watching this video. If you made it this far, hit that like button. If you enjoy this type of content, hit the subscribe button for more content. Both of these things really help the channel grow. If you have anything to share, feel free to leave a comment. I read every single comment on this channel, and I'm pretty good at replying back. Anyway, have a good one.